<laughs> yeah. All right, welcome. Great to see such a big crowd for today's meetup. Uh, I want to just uh, quickly run through what we're going to do today. I'm going to have a, a quick description about what we're about and what this, why this meetup is here. Um, talk a little bit on behalf of our sponsor, and then we're going to jump right into our panel, and there'll be a few wrap-up uh, things at the end. We're not going to waste a lot of time in ceremony. Uh, how many of you are first-timers? Wow. Thank you and welcome. Uh, please don't let this be the last time. Keep coming. We'd love to have you. Uh, this group, it was put together, geez, about two and a half years ago now, I guess, um, by a bunch of folks who said, wouldn't it be great if we got together and started talking about this? We, we had a, an initial meeting, and it went well, and then we sort of spun it off into uh, an ongoing meetup, um, and we, we met at... Uh, at Service Master for a little while, then last year we moved here to the FedEx Institute, uh, and we meet about every six weeks. And we cover um, all kinds of things uh, related to the DevOps uh, topics and in, in, in transformations, etc. Um, things like continuous integration, continuous integration and continuous delivery tools. We've talked about automated testing. We've talked about um, Infrastructure as code, automatic server deployments, uh, containerization, um, various tooling. Uh, you know, one thing about DevOps space is that it's very tool rich, uh, and there's there's a lot of different things uh, that we've been looking at in that space. Uh, and we have just had various formats as well. We've had the traditional speaker where we present a topic and the speaker comes in and talks about that with the group. We've done breakout sessions where uh, the group comes together and we form two or three small groups and we discuss individual topics just amongst your peers. Those have been really good at helping folks in the Memphis community understand what each other's doing. Uh, and it's a really good way to, to feel that you're in it with somebody else, that you're all in it together, you all have the same problems, you all have uh, the same challenges, and uh, getting that opportunity to learn has been good. And then uh, one of my favorite formats is the panel format, which we have today, we did one earlier in the year as well, um, where we bring three uh, distinguished people in, or sometimes they're distinguished and sometimes they're not, it depends upon uh, you know, how much money we can you know, put on the table for them. Uh, I, these guys didn't get any money, well, you know. <laughs> really? Yeah. We'll talk about it later. Water. Uh, yeah, exactly, it's water. Um, so we're going to start here in just a minute. A quick note on logistics. Please eat pizza. Please, if you, are, if you look in front of you and there's not a plate of pizza, you're doing something wrong. So please eat pizza, grab some drinks. If you haven't been in this building before, the restrooms are down this hall on the right-hand side. Uh, if you need to take a phone call, please feel free. Just step out of the room. You're not a prisoner here. Um, and you know, join back when you're, when you're ready. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors for today's meeting. First off, we have um, FedEx Institute Technology. Uh, folks, uh, Claudio and Rami and, and Cody have been uh, very generous in donating space here. We were supposed to all be cramped up over in uh, room 225 today. We had such a big turnout that they graciously let us uh, use the fishbowl, which is not normally used for meetings like this, so it's very much appreciated. Uh, they have been, uh, they've been very generous in donating their space. We're going to continue to meet here next year. Uh, so it's, I'm glad it's provided us a nice stable place to have these meetings. Um, and then I also want to thank uh, Telogen Tech, who uh, provided the food for today. Unfortunately, they, um, Ashwin with Telogen Tech could not make it today. He is in India, um, carrying on, on sick parents. Um, but he did send a couple slides, and I kind of want to just walk through you, just tell you a little bit about what they do. They, uh, Intelligent Tech is a consulting company. They were founded back in 2012. Uh, I've worked with them a bit. I have a couple of folks that I work with at Service Master, uh, who they found for us. Um, and they, you know, they're a, a full gamut uh, consulting company, but they do, they do have some strong expertise in finding DevOps uh, engineering and DevOps resources. Uh, they also have some strengths in cybersecurity. Uh, they've done SAP consulting uh, and robotics, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, if you're into the certifications, you can see all that stuff there. But I like the I like the client <coughs> partner logos. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of biggies on there: Microsoft, MicroStrategy, Amazon. Um, so if you're in, if you need uh, further information, please come up and see me after the after the uh, 
meeting today. I'd be happy to get you contacted with the folks there. And we thank them for sponsoring the, uh, the food and beverage. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to talk a little bit about the format for today. Um, by the way, my name is Dan Pettit. I don't think I introduced myself earlier. I am um, uh, one of the founders and the organizer of the Men DevOps Meetup. I will be the moderator for today, so I'll kind of be bouncing questions back and forth. Uh, I'm currently with Hilton, and my background is, is uh, enterprise architecture and uh, now DevOps, doing a lot in the DevOps space. Um, I'm very excited to have three great panelists with us today. I'm going to be bouncing questions back and forth to them. We will open it up to questions in between as we move between questions and on the panel. We'll open it up to the the audience here, if you have additional comments or additional questions you want to follow up on, we'll turn it over there and we'll continue to work through. We'll be finishing a little before four o'clock. That being said, I want to choose Robert Doty. Robert? Uh, Robert is CIO over at uh, Service Master. Uh, he, I'm not going to read this entire thing just because yeah. you don't want to listen to me sit here and, and talk, but uh, I, I had the pleasure of working with Robert um, when he joined back in 2014. <laughs> And uh, he served as interim CIO and then uh, became CIO of Service Master after the, the company split from um, uh, American Home Shield. And he actually was interim CIO for both organizations for a period of time. Uh, prior to joining Service Master, he was with uh, Nissan and uh, also worked with Oracle. Um, we're really excited to have him here today. Next up is Furkan Huda with Hilton. Furkan has been at Hilton for 17 years. Uh, and he's been focused on DevOps for about the last three years. Um, he's, he's working closely with our CTO and other uh, partners in IT to help establish formal DevOps practices, including CICD, infrastructure as code, uh, et cetera. Um, and in particular, he and his team have been instrumental in uh, maturing Hilton's cloud adoption uh, and the cloud platform. So we're excited to have him here as well. And last but not least, Seth Reginald with FedEx. Uh, Seth did not send me a bio until the last minute, and I had a whole bunch of things made up about Seth <laughs> that I was going to put in on the bio. It's and right he really right my top. fun. <laughs> I was going to cut it off anyway. Uh, but Seth is Director of Enterprise Platform Engineering at FedEx Services, uh, where he is responsible for their enterprise-level CICD pipelines, um, the Enterprise Data Analytics Framework, um, Enterprise Application Inventory, which is a big deal at FedEx, uh, and uh, system team support for their core systems, their core services. Uh, he was an intern, joined in 2005, a while ago, and then uh, worked his way up through management and and uh, became a, in, converted to management, as he said. And I don't know that, what kind of conversion process that is. <laughs> I'm like sure it involves some form yeah. of holy water. Painful. <laughs> yeah. um, back in 2014. Uh, and I have to ask, it, it, the, last little, the last little line in his, his bio is very interesting. Um, Seth previously uh, served on the Make-A-Wish Associate Board of Directors and earned a fortune, and that's where my reading stopped. He earned a fortune <laughs> then of experience um, <laughs> through a seed hatchery startup. What the hell is a seed hatchery startup? So anyone in the audience know what seed hatchery is by chance? So seed hatchery, shout out. Um, is was a startup accelerator in Memphis that started in 2011, and I was honored to be one of the initial companies that were funded through that startup accelerator project. And I uh, gained a fortune of experience, uh, but unfortunately no fortune from that experience. <laughs> so that's that's the line. That's the line. Yeah. Excellent. We're, we're very very uh, grateful to have you here. Let's jump in. These are the questions we're going to be asking. We'll take these in turn, um, and I'm going to bounce back and forth between our panelists and give them a chance to respond. So the very first question today is, how do you approach transforming an organization to enable DevOps practices? Who wants this one first? Let's start with Seth. Sure. So I'm going to just hit some high-level things, and hopefully my partners here will, will expand or take it in a completely different direction. And can you guys in the back hear me okay? All right. Excellent. Um, this is a big question with, you know, a lot of strategic components, but I'm a Simon Sinek fan, so you have to start with why would you ever want to do this? And that value has to resonate, most importantly, with your development community, and second most, but only just, with your senior officers that are actually going to fund and prioritize and communicate the value of such transformation initiative. 
Once you've done that, you have to establish consistent goals and as important, consistent terminology. Shout out to Dan and some of the uh, training and education that he's done in the past to ensure that you're all on the same page in terms of where we're heading. Um, and then it's, it's kind of up to, in, in our case, the central team to define a paved path that makes the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. Because what we know about developers are they're like water or electricity, they'll follow the path of least resistance. So our job as the CICD team, um, kind of watching out for the enabler of DevOps best practices, is to treat that as a product, just like any product with a customer base. And we're not done until our customers are delighted with that, both in terms of quantitative measures, how much is it being used, how fast are we deploying, how often are we deploying, what's our change failure rate, um, as well as qualitatively, what's working, what's not working, how can we improve these aspects of our CICD pipeline or any other DevOps best practice. And maybe with that, I'll let my colleagues. Yeah, so on. I guess I'll tag on, you know, I'll start from the opposite side of how do you not do that? You know, you, you don't create a team, call them the DevOps team, and throw a bunch of tools at them, right? That is, unfortunately, part of the way that we started ours at ServiceMaster was way back in the way back machine, right? And somewhere in a area of the building, you know, the engineering team wasn't getting their code deployed fast enough, and so they started kind of building their own pipelines and doing their own thing. And we threw tooling at them, and we said, oh, great, now you guys kind of did this. You're the DevOps team, so here's some more money, here's some more tooling. And we never really took the step back and said, this is not a team. This is not a small little practice. This is how the organization really needs to operate, and this needs to be the culture that we go from there. So I wish, you know, four and a half years ago, we would have st stood back and said, let's answer this question before we actually start on the, the journey that we've been on. Since then, we've changed it all up, right? Now we really do start to think, and Dan was a large part of that for our organization, what are we trying to accomplish, right? What are the goals we have? What are the major KPIs that we're really gonna be influencing? Uh, one of the biggest learnings we came out of it is we just learn through all of this, right? The, the tools are a way to get better information, instrumentation, so that we can adapt and, and change the way we're doing things. We had lofty goals, 10 deploys a day, right? That's been ingrained in a lot of our heads that we wanted to do 10 deploys a day because we felt if we could do that, the friction of deployments would be you know, down, so it was good that we had a goal, but that didn't really mean anything. It didn't resonate with the app dev teams, the engineers, the, you know, the QAs, anything like that. So, what we did was we kind of took a stop down, we changed the teams, we put a little more structure around it, we started creating some goals, some charter submissions, really starting evangelizing why are we doing DevOps again? It's not a team, it's not a person, it's the way that we are going to be doing the work. And once we started that, we started getting more and more kind of traction, we started getting more involvement across the organization, the engineers were a little more engaging into it, the infrastructure folks were a little more engaging into it, we started transforming the technologies we have to enable DevOps because we had a lot of legacy systems that it just didn't make sense. And so uh, when we were making those transformations, that enabled the culture to, to snowball and, and really start to pick up a lot faster. So for us, you know, if, if I could go back and really set the why are we doing this and making sure that the entire organization really understood that why, we would be light years ahead of where we are today. I think one of the things I hear at times is, you know, um, how do you get started, you know, because a lot of times, you know, there, there are organizations where management may not see or understand what DevOps is, and that's where I think, you know, there needs to be some grassroots movement to help show the benefits of DevOps, you know, what you can achieve, uh, um, reducing cycle time or, you know, cost and not needing the amount of resources to do something. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always harder going down that way path, you know, from the bottom up where you kind of have to show the value before you can get the funding or the resources um, to do what you need to do from a DevOps perspective. Luckily, though, at Hilton, you know, we were able to um, work top down where we were able to secure resources, funding to be able to formally um, adopt DevOps practices, create a DevOps culture, and um, uh, create the right tooling, working with our development teams in conjunction to adopt and really utilize those practices. And that's a big part of it is the application development teams as well, coming along with the DevOps uh, practices and being able to truly utilize the tools that they're putting into play. So it's not just throwing tools out there like Rob, Robert was saying, because um, nobody's going to use them otherwise. So really being able to show them the value as well. So follow-up question to that. You, you each mentioned sort of this in different words, buy-in. 
Um, and I'm particularly interested in your approach and your thoughts on getting buy-in from leadership and what that really means and how you were able to accomplish it. Where did, where did you, you know, obviously talking about how you approach it is one thing, but getting support for that approach is part and parcel to making it a success. Yep. How did you, how did you do that? What did you do to, to drive the message home? Furkan, you talked about grassroots and making, showing the example. Yep. Um, and I'd say, I think one of the big things Hilton always strive towards is speed to market and improving that. I think that was one of the big factors in being able to show how we can reduce cycle times, right? For development teams being able to and give quick feedback, allow them to be able to iterate quickly and uh, move towards more of an agile model. Uh, is I think what I think was beneficial in that. Sure. Yeah, ours was a little bit of brute force. Um, you know, the, the, the mantra of 10 employees a day did help, right? So that, you know, from the, you know, the CIO all the way down to an individual engineer, you know, we were all aware that our goal was 10 deploys a day, you know, in a particular set of technology. The, the, the really rallying cry around the leadership was simplicity, right? Removing roadblocks, removing all of these chains of approval or discussions whenever you wanted to go do something. That was a huge value add that as a leader, you're thinking, wow, I can free my people's time up to do something that's more valuable than chasing down a CR or building yet another server or deploying code one more time, we can do that through automated scripts. So that was it. That was a, as a leader and selfishly for me, that was one of my big drivers. I think for us, just to maybe shine a different aspect to this question, um, this has been a long sales pitch for uh, our organization. And what it took was being able to represent the needs from across the organization. When I say across the organization, if you look at FedEx Corporation, there's like 10 different operating companies within it. We have employees across the globe. But for us to be able to articulate the patterns in terms of getting a little bit faster with between what we call idea and release and being able to deploy more frequently and being able to essentially give that value and time back to our business partners, either in terms of the next greatest idea or faster delivery of the current idea, um, being ready with that message when the opportunity presented itself. And, not, and, and frankly, it wasn't the first time, it probably wasn't even the 10th time that some of uh, the stakeholders had heard it, but having the right message with the right audience at the right time with basically the bought-in support um, across the organization is what it took to get the uh, senior officer commitment. Great. Any follow-up questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Eric, go ahead. Why is buy-in difficult from your leadership? Question is why is buy-in difficult from your leadership? Because yeah. it's transformative for sure, but why? Do they want to be left behind? I, I don't think they quite see the value sometimes. And you know, always being asked for money and resources, you know, you always have to present the case, you know, to be able to, you know, get those funds and why you know, what, what are we gonna get out of that? It's always a question being asked, right? So I, I think I, that's the challenging part is painting that picture and being able to show them that is what's challenging. But I think the value is definitely there. Is, I think. I'll, I'll follow on to your answer. Funny, interesting, because that's that's a logical yep. leadership objection. Wasn't there any money being spent on pouring waterfall stuff that needed to be potentially diverted or faster, better in your ability and your continuous delivery pipeline? Yeah, but, uh, you know, but to be honest, I think there's always a, when you start something new, there's always a time where you're kind of running the old and the new in yeah. parallel. It's not like one goes away immediately. So I think, uh, you know, being able to show that, you know, that increase is going to come out at the end as, you know, give a result in savings at the end. I don't know that we hit a lot of objections so much as constantly, you know, challenging the value that's being delivered, right? So that's where... You know, we came up with a lot of interesting metrics. It was, it's trying to articulate the value that we're getting by having these pipelines, right? And one of the ones that I think that really kind of tripped the, tri tripped the, the trigger and stopped all of the questions was when we really showed where the, the volume of code check-ins was happening is where we we're focusing our, our pipelines at. You know, it may not have been where the most expensive te technology was, but it clearly was where all of our engineering uh, was happening. That allowed them to see, oh, okay, this is value over here, right? It's not my giant legacy system that 6,000 people log in every day. 
it's this one over here that we're moving to, and, and this is where all the activity is, right? I have 1% of my, you know, my, my code check-ins are over on my legacy system. 95% of them are on this area over here. No wonder I'm focusing all my air. That's, we, we kept getting a lot of those questions. Why, why are you doing it over here? You should be doing it on this giant legacy system. We were like, no, that's not the place to do it. It's over here. So once we did that, it, it became a lot easier, I think. The only thing I'll add is um, audience matters, and the the justification for your CIO may be slightly different than your justification for your CFO. And the evidence that the CFO needs may require a few reps in you know a controlled environment to basically show that this does in fact add value across across all of the priorities that we're constantly juggling and trying to figure out. You know what's 1A and 1B and 1C, um, and tuning the message appropriately to get whatever stakeholders you need aligned sometimes takes time. And yeah, some people are predisposed to want to hear the pro problem or to be accepting to it, and others are predisposed to automatically be defensive of it, particularly if there's money involved. Yeah. Okay. So, was there another question here? Yeah. Yes. Go so ahead. So one, I forget which one. One you spoke about not just creating the DevOps team. How do you? articulate that not being the right way and getting people to look at it more holistically when you look at a lot of other things like architecture, infrastructure, and people kind of fall into that default, like we need a team for this to own this and not let everybody else have to worry about getting in their way. Yeah, so full transparency, we had a DevOps team called that up until pretty recently. We now finally like, no, we're rebranding this team because that's not just what they do and that's not, you know, the rest of the organization does that. So for us, it, it was small, small wins, right, is, is really where this is. We have, uh, we've had a series of what we'll call enterprise level issues and, and obstacles and problems to solve. And we, you know, that team, the, the engineering team now, it was the DevOps team, they were central to a lot of the solutioning of that. So we would grab architects and, and the leaders of the, the, the systems engineering team, DevOps team, the app dev engineers, we'd throw all of them into a room and say, here's the problem, you guys go solve this, right? And that, as that they started collaborating, that started really helping fix the where it isn't just one team that does this, right? Yeah, they, they manage a suite of tools that help all the rest of this organization. You know, that the, the other side tangential, and I'll get a little bit into the, to some of the other ones, is that, that, that personal transformation people are making through this, right? If you look at the organization four years ago to where it is today, you know, we haven't changed a ton of people. Yeah, there's been people changes, but we have changed individual people, meaning, you know, somebody who used to be an iSeries, you know, AS400 developer, you know, is now, you know, a leader of our, you know, our systems engineering team, right? They've made that full transformation. We've had people that were, you know, operations, and now they are DevOps engineers. They are in Ansible, they're in Puppet, they're in those tools, you know, maintaining and creating our configuration. So it's been fun to see the personal transformation. They all want to be DevOps, you know. I mean, that, they want that yeah. title. I it's know. become, it's, it's now the new sexy. Yeah. Right, so everyone wants to be part of it, or at least a lot of engineering folks want to be part of it, yeah. even if they don't really know what it means yet. Yeah. Anything else follow up, or we, we have one more question here? So quick question, kind of a funny question, but the DevOps handbook is popular, but I feel like alongside it, Phoenix Project was kind of like a handbook for like how to sell this. Um, and it's sort of cheesy to some extent, and it's a novel. But I wonder if for any of you guys, like you, uh, that played a role in selling it to people not in DevOps roles. And if y'all use that either by directly encouraging people to read it or using analogy. Um, because I find myself sharing stories and referencing it a lot. <coughs> So I'll go over there again. So, you know, we, we started this as part of an overall agile transformation. So it wasn't like we were just going to do this. So the, the notion of Phoenix Project, a lot of people on the, our book badge service master folks have, have read that book. And I don't know if the guy's name was Pete or whoever was the, the main cog that was blocking everything, right? You know, everyone would refer to an individual or two as, as Pete or whatever. So, so that did make its way through us, but I don't think we use that as a prescriptive playbook or you know a mantra that said everyone who wants to be involved should go read this book, right? It was much more along the line. Again, trying to explain the why are we doing this? What are the value that each individual would get out of a, a culture like this and, and having the capabilities that, that, that we're gonna enable through this? Um, 
technology or set of technology. Any other follow-up? I think it's it's resources like that that help both within an organization and just probably all the people in this room. You mentioned a couple of books. I bet 90% know exactly what you're referring to. The fact that those things exist and have sort of a natural um, they're they're naturally attractive to those of us in the room help establish that consistent terminology some of those consistent um uh, even a vocabulary to talk about devops i mean 10 years ago if you said devops people were looking like what are you, what are you talking about i have no idea what you mean so uh, i tend not to refer to the books explicitly saying hey go read this and and you'll understand but rather borrow concept here an aspect here a measurement here and use that as sort of a backdrop of confidence that these are probably the right approaches because it's documented as such. Excellent. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Thanks, guys. Um, question two. Let's start with Robert this time. Uh, what aspects of a DevOps transformation have you found to be easiest and or hardest and why? Yeah, so I'll start with the easiest and we kind of touched on this. Tooling is something I think that We've, we've implemented and re-implemented our tooling practices across the different stacks of, of the chain, right? And, and you know, we, we started out with, these are the six tools that we need and we're gonna have the perfect, you know, pipeline. And, and then we said, well, actually those aren't it. These are the ones. And then we said, nope, these are the ones, these are the ones. And those are easy to change out, right? You know, we get requests for, hey, I, I wanna change this to that. And it's a net zero cost for us. So we're like, yes, go change it out. Uh, so I, I think overall, if you were to put kind of the, the the kind of wheel that you see out there, oftentimes that you know that shows the different tools that are around the different practices, we've probably had 50% of all of those in our environment. So I think changing out and implementing the tooling is the easy thing. That's what as IT people we're good at anyway, right? So that that has always been the easier side to me. The harder side is it's adapting the processes and policies um, that we operate under, right? So I mentioned a little bit around change management. Audit is a huge trouble for us still, right? How do you match what our SOCs or our PCI auditors are looking for when it comes to configuration management and servers and what server was deployed where at each time? When you're operating in this capacity and servers are, you know, you're not even using servers in some instances, right? You're not creating all of this documentation and rigid information around server ABC123 was in existence from January 1st to January 19th. And this is the CR that you know created it. This is the CR that, that killed it. We're not keeping up with all that because it's just a bunch of you know use, useless information. So, working with our internal auditors, working with our external auditors, making sure that they understood the journey that we're going on and that the way that they perform their audits has to change because we're not creating the same level of data archive that we had in the past when it was just spin up a server, spin down a server, and it was this painful. That's by far, and we haven't solved it. We're working our way still through that, um, but but that's been, to me, my opinion, the, the farthest or the hardest thing about it. Yeah, I'd probably say adoption um, has probably been the hardest thing. I think what we've done is taken steps even to say, if you're moving to our cloud, uh, you kind of have to follow and go through these processes, which I think has helped teams see the benefits and really help adopt those practices, but I think that's probably been the hardest. Um, mindset wise being able to get them to adopt and change from what they've been doing with their you know legacy applications on a day-to-day -day basis um so that's where i believe it's probably been the hardest but i think we've done things to help make that easier for them just move to them devops practices um easiest um i'd probably say this sim similarly you know being able to get all get all the right tools uh, get them working together set of pipelines etc i think those are all some things that we were able to do fairly quickly, but then being able to really leverage them across different applications, I think, is where um, it took some time for us to get there. So easiest, the tools, although that doesn't mean it's easy. There are decisions to make and there are investments to make and there are, you know, adoption frameworks or otherwise that make it easy to actually interact with the tools. Um, and the hardest to kind of tack on to the adoption side is absolutely uh, sitting with a development team and convincing them that doing more and having more responsibility is actually beneficial to you as a team and you know IT uh, as a whole and that's that's a hard sell so being able to relate 
the value in their terms, right? Whatever their aspect of the business is or their current challenge, maybe they're really tired of uh, the lack of an integrated test environment. Well, helping articulate the value proposition in terms that they understand and that are the pain that they're feeling today uh, helps ease that adoption. But sometimes you have to have 15 different stories to get you know, 15 unique teams to embrace some of the practices and the new tooling. So I, just in following up, you all mentioned tools being fairly easy. Obviously, there's, there's different things. It, has there been any part of the tooling that you, that you were surprised at how easy it was, or was it all just pretty straightforward? It's all easy for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go do, right? Yeah, I was like, go do that. Whatever you want to do, go do it. Um, I, I, I don't think that there was any that was like, wow, that was much easier. I, I think what, where we struggled, and then I say we because you and I did, was in the visualization and instrumentation of kind of the collective, right? That's where I think we, we really had some early uh, early struggles there, right? Because we were trying to kind of piecemeal 17 things together into this one stream of, hey, this is this is the journey that this particular uh, release went into, right? Um, as we've evolved, that's become uh, a little more effective and a little more easier, but that was one of the early struggles with, yes, it's easy to put an individual tool in, but stitching all of that together so you see the, the life cycle of a release, that, that, that was extremely yeah, difficult up so front. So getting the individual pieces together and yeah. getting them cobbled together, but making them behave as a piece, a cohesive whole, right. was a challenge. Okay, good. Any, any other thoughts? I probably the reason I would say I guess easiest to that is probably I think it's more within our control, right? Um, being able to get something to work, or uh, so the number of challenges were still there, but I think it's more within your control to be able to work through those. Why? Yeah, I, I always say when I when I teach on this subject and, and talk with people about this is that. DevOps is not a technology problem, it's a people problem. And but technologists <clears throat> relate to technology and tools are technology. So we immediately gravitate towards them and we find that to be the easiest part. Yep. But effectively leveraging them to make the impact that you need, I think, is, is key. Uh, is that anything, anything to add? I don't think so. Um, just to echo your comment that even though it's not easy, it's simpler than the people problem. The tooling is a simpler yeah. challenge to solve than the, than the people aspect. It was really enlightening to me uh, as a practitioner in this space. I, I've now started thinking of, a, of all technology problems are really just people problems, right? They're, they're, they're really all that way now. And I, I'm like, well, what, you know, and it's a completely different mindset than I had even, say, five years ago. Uh, so I, I, I've learned, I've lived through some of this transformation. I, I, I appreciate what you guys are saying. Are there thoughts or questions? It's a question on the people problems. Can you talk a little bit more about where you found yourself using where you find yourself using stick and why? We're all jumping right into that. <laughs> you can't mention me by name. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, you know, yeah, because we did this as part of our overall agile transformation, you know, we, we already had kind of a big carrot out there. Uh, the, the, Right. I think where where we struggle and had to use the stick was we had some teams that wanted to do things their way because it was easier for them, but it wasn't easier for the enterprise as a whole. And so really helping them understand, you know, you can't this isn't Burger King, you can't always have it your way, right? You need to you need to bend a little bit to, to get into the, the centralized pipeline structure and using the centralized tooling, right? You you may think that this tool is better for you because of the technology stack that you're using, but we really can use to satisfy your, your, your needs here and it makes everyone a lot better. You know, that, that was the only probably that we need a little WD-40 to kind of get them involved and, and wrenched into it. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think We've had, we haven't had a horrible, what I would say, full adoption. I think it was more like, I really want to do my thing this way, and we've had to bend people to, to get them to, to adjust to the enterprise scale. I think for us, it's important to understand who your kind of innovators or early adopters are and make sure that you have a very solid understanding of what, what they would define as quality. We have a saying at FedEx, customers define quality. So being able to understand that and orient your solution, be it practice or um, a particular behavior or a tool chain to what they expect 
gives you kind of the confidence that, all right, this is a tried and tested solution for the best and brightest within our development ecosystem. How can we create a scoreboard that encourages that type of adoption and that type of behavior? And then we don't have to worry about carrots and sticks because that seems to be a, um, an adequate tool for us to... So gamification. Yeah. 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 And frankly, you know, if you have an, an organizational structure with several different uh, business units or aspects of development and you show that, you know, if you were over in this quadrant and if you were over here, the natural tendency is these people want to, they fear the rear, right? They want to get out of here and then the people in the middle often want to go up to the, to the top right. So, but you, but again, to reemphasize, you can't just say, this is the way we're doing it. Here's your carrot and fear the stick. Because if it's not resonating with the people that are actually adopting, even with your high performers, then you're fighting a losing battle. It's only a matter of time before the whole thing's going to collapse anyway. Yeah, um, I think the only time I feel like we've had to kind of push is really with teams, some teams that weren't willing to adopt or wanted to do things their way. So I think we've even gotten into architecture discussions about how they should move to the cloud or how they should be utilizing the DevOps tools. Um, so I think that's probably where I think we've had to push, uh, use the stick, say, to get some of those teams to kind of come on board and realize. Yeah. You, you paint the path of least resistance, yes. right? You show them the path of least resistance, and then you hit the ones that aren't yeah. following it. <laughs> <laughs> when they should be, or when they easily could be. Is there uh, any other questions? Yeah. I have a related one. So, uh, uh, at least in our world, a lot of what we're doing is very iterative, right? So what we think is the right way to do it, like, may last a week, and then it's like, oh, no, this is not, this isn't working for a myriad of reasons. How do we all keep that consistent communication so that everyone knows what, as you iterate quickly, what the right thing to do is? Because something we've already run into is we start this transformation as teams hear the first message, and they think this is, this is all I need to know, this is the standard now, and they don't listen anymore, and then three weeks later, a month later, the world's changed, and they're now doing it the wrong way again, and they're very frustrated because they th thought they were doing it right, and they're suddenly not. Is swapping out tools, or it's, 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 out it's doing a transformation towards being much more, for us, fluid in how we are much more flexible in how we do releases to uh, in the retail space in the stores. So we're going from a very one at a time, you do this release, and this is the release that's everywhere to a, you can do pilots, you have a much more flexible release process that now is using a tooling set that's not manual. So we're going to a true DevOps world, but that means that as we do this transformation, the tooling in that and the processes that the team has to undergo change dramatically as, as we're moving along. I'll use an example, I don't know if this necessarily applies to you, but um, I think one of the things I think you asked about as well was having a DevOps team. You know, I think that was a way for us to start, right? But as we stated, DevOps practices are something that everybody needs to do. You know, it's not just that team. But so, you know, developers were committing code to a certain repository. From there, we were able to, you know, kind of take, you know, whatever build and deployment activities need to occur and, and iterate and change those. And, you know, so, so, we kind of separated their concern to where they're just focusing on development and checking in their code, and we're kind of focused on the build and deployment portion of it and making sure we get it right. Um, sure. so that's one approach we took. Well, yeah, I mean, so you know, my work's a little bit, actually, a lot different from these guys. Our, our folks are almost all in the same building, right? So it's very easy to, to reach out and grab somebody, right? And so the interactions, the, the personal interactions we have between the the systems engineering team and the, the application engineering teams, they're, they're sitting next to each other or they're seeing each other in the halls. We do our, and under our skilled agile framework, we all get together every 10 or 12 weeks anyway and we talk about what we're going to do. So all of those touch-ups and, and meetups are, are pretty there. When there is a, a major change or a, you know, a, a, an enabler that we're, that we're releasing out, that comes out as part of those regular cadences. So I, I don't have the same kind of challenges where you know, they might be in Europe or in, you know, sure. Asia Pac, where, you know, you have to get these things across. I would say if you could bottle the answer and sell it, I'd buy yeah. it. <laughs> um, it is a persistent and a never-ending challenge to communicate um, the right message to the right audience at the right time, such that that information is received. The best case is that 
a, a team or whomever you're interacting with receives the information exactly when they need it. So if it's, you know, trying to get conversions or adoptions that, you know, whatever your landing page is for your self-service modules to have all the information they need right there in front of them, staring them in the face with like a big button that says, you know, help, right, if you need the help. Um, we do a ton of push communication. We leverage all sorts of collaboration tooling and channels. I mean, you name it, we've got it. We're trying to do as much as we possibly can. And despite that, there's always someone that comes and goes, what are you, you know, what are you doing? I got this thing six months ago and you, you, you've moved my cheese and now the whole world's going to stop any exception. So I, that's, a, that's kind of a, a way to commiserate with the question. I don't know if it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, if it's an excellent answer other than to say that um, the, the interpretation of what you're communicating you don't get to define success there. It's the other person that actually defines whether or not you're successful. Other follow-up questions? So yes, sir. In the role that I'm in now, it seems like uh, dependency is the biggest challenge. So how did you guys overcome that as part of your plan? I'll go. Um, I would say it's it's a persistent challenge. We're certainly not done, but um, we've got some real impressive teams that have either leaned into virtualized services, um, mocks, be it uh, data or otherwise, um, you know, upstream or downstream services, and really being accountable for every interaction that their application should embrace or should expect in the production environment, up to and including consistent branching and version control strategies that are um, adopted within that portion of the ecosystem. Uh, but that's one of those cultural transformation things that is kind of hard to sell if the team is totally dependent upon an integrated test environment to ensure that they're not going to bring down you know, their aspect of the business. Yeah, I'd probably say, you know, having you know, API contracts and, you know, ensuring we talk, discuss how, um, among, across different teams, you know, whether, what breaking changes are allowed or ensuring those are communicated to ensure, to understand upstream, downstream impacts of things um, is one of the things we did to kind of help with that challenge. Do you guys require contracts? Yes. All our services. Yeah, probably the thing we did that helped it, a couple of things. Um, you know, we, we structured the teams in a way that we have more dedicated architecture now. And so the architects helped to really paint a picture and grab the right people in the rooms when they when they see those opportunities. The, you know, the scaled agile framework, the way we do it is very collaborative, right? You can't help but talk with other people in that in that model, right? And so that, that helps a lot. But then Putting that that architecture group overarching, saying you're responsible for this suite, right? And so, you know, if, if something happens or you know this group's struggling over here, you know, they are responsible for helping shepherd them through that and understanding the dependencies. The the versioning is an interesting thing because you know that that's an area where we've traditionally struggled, and we're I think we're about to embark with some creative engineering to to really surpass that and not have that be such a blocker anymore because that was one of our that was one of our large uh, struggles where, you know, we had 37 versions of the different things, right? So that's not the that's not the right way to go. And then the ultimate catch is our incident management process is the one who catches all of that, right? Where uh, we had to adapt some of those to really understand, you know, when something breaks, how do we get to the right spot to, to fix that, right? Because we don't catch all of our dependencies, you know, out of the gate. So we had to make some changes there as well. One more question. Um, how many different technologies do you, uh, do you all support when trying to do like the uh, the DevOps transformation? Because one of the things that we've experienced is we support almost every technology out there as far as, you know, like Nginx, Apache, Tomcat, JBoss, you know, and the thing is each one of those animals is a little different. Y'all just deal with a small handful of technologies or is it wide and varied like ours? So, We've kind of abstracted that problem, I'd like to say, um, by using the container environment. So we package and run whatever technology the development team wants to use within that container. So we just take what they have, package it, 
and deploy it into a container in mind, right, to kind of get around. Yeah, for us, we don't, it isn't for everyone, right? You know, it, it's, uh, I, I don't know exactly the technology that we do support, but I can tell you that it is not 100% of our technologies are, are running through these pipelines, right? It is the active technologies for certain, that's where we put our focus on. Um, you know, new technologies for us get introduced all the time, so the team has to be very responsive to, oh, okay, so I gotta go do this containerization. There's been a big, big piece to us, right? You know, what Connor mentioned earlier, the notion of, hey, if you're going to the cloud, you need to be operating in this fashion, right? You know, that's helped us a lot as well, where, you know, we're trying to be very um, informative to our engineering team to be, we're gonna create a new API or a new application or a new service use these technologies because they're going to plug right into where we're where we're going uh, or where we're at right now trying to, to remove as much on-prem as, as we can. I think it just boils down to priorities I mean it's a, it's a ruthless prioritization exercise just like any other if you have the resources and the ability to support every single technology that your customer brace is bring, bringing to you that's awesome but if you don't justify your cut line and stick to it. All right, let's go ahead and jump on to the next question. Third one, what is your approach to hiring for a DevOps culture? Let's start with Furcon this time. One thing I'd like to ask is just you know, have them explain to me what DevOps means. I think that's an interesting question to hear and answer to. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and there's not one straight answer per se, but I'd like to hear their version of it and what it means to them. Uh, I think is something that's important. Uh, other things, you know, just uh, the tools and technologies that we use that we're looking for, I think is also important to have those skill sets. And then uh, three, just uh, I would say is more around uh, personality and mindset, you know, um, how they feel about Agile, you know, are they really thinking outside the box on certain things, or, or is it more of, we've been doing this for so long and we're going to continue doing this, right? So looking for those types of things, um, you know, that truly will um, help us with our DevOps culture. Yeah, I think for us it's been the learning mindset, right? You know, internally we've transitioned some folks into roles that, you know, maybe five years ago I would have never imagined they would roll into, right? And they, and they're there now, external people. You know, we look for lifelong learners, we look for cloud technologies, we look for uh, a little bit of infrastructure, a little bit of software engineering, right? But it, it is, it's the, the mindset and the, the interactions we've had. The, the great question right out of the gate is, what do you mean when you think of DevOps, right? Because we would all answer that pretty differently, right? Some of us, you know, it's probably gonna be two sides of the fence there, right? But it's a very, you know, I've had hour-long conversations with a certain moderator around what the hell is he talking about when he's thinking DevOps versus what I'm thinking DevOps, right? So, um, you know, getting that as a, as a conversation starter when you're in the actual interview process, but um, and, and honing into what does it mean for the company that you're looking at as well, right? Because my DevOps is going to be different than yours, and it's different from from his. So Welcome, I, Robert. I enjoyed it too. Yeah. <laughs> Good times, Dan. Good times. I actually meant to do this at the onset, but no time like the present. I'm going to delay my answer for a bit. Audience participation question. By show of hands, how many of you are in management? Okay. How many of you are developers? How many, <laughs> how many of you are uh, architects? And uh, how many of you are salespeople? All right, salespeople. Okay. Um, so for hiring DevOps, learning mindset, absolutely part and parcel. The ability and the eagerness to solve problems. But the one consistent thread, and I don't know if, if, if I'm borrowing this from a previous day in conversation or, or formal training, Continuous and relentless improvement. You know, there's if there were a recipe for DevOps, then we wouldn't be in the room here together, right? There, there is not one size fits all. There is not, you know, steps that you can execute and be successful. What is true for any DevOps transformation is team accountability for continuous improvement, whatever the team decides that is. I think that's it's interesting. Did anyone go to the DevOps Enterprise Summit this year? Anyone in the room? 
Yeah, I, um, I got a chance to go, I was in Vegas a few weeks ago, and one thing that I discovered there is this is the biggest DevOps on-site conference in the world, right? Uh, this is the biggie. And I got there and I was, you know, sort of expecting to hear a whole bunch of different things that I never heard before. And what I came away with was really reassuring that we're all in this mess together <laughs> and that everybody has the same sets of challenges and that they're all figuring out interesting ways of, of getting better and better and better. And they discover that when they get better in one area, it allows them to get better in another area, which then impacts, it's sort of a snowball, right? And so it's, you, you get continuous improvement. And one of the key speakers there was Nicole Forsgren, who hates the idea of maturity models because it makes it seem like you start and you stop once you're mature. And, and her main reason is it's really a continuous mindset. You, you, you're always, you always are starting exactly where you are, and you're never ending. So I, I thought that was a, an interesting uh, play. That's what the whole, seems to me, what the whole industry is going through right now. Great. Follow-up questions. All right. We'll go ahead and move on to question number four. What benefits have you seen as a result of your transformation? And how do you measure success? It's kind of an awkward question, but what I was driving at here is, um, if it's working, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know if it's how do you know if it's working? When your development teams are not complaining. Yeah, when yeah. so the noise ratio goes down. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, start. Um, so I think we look at metrics like um, cycle time, and um, you know. A lot of being able to deploy how many times a day, you know, we, we provide the capability to be able to do that. Um, Self-service tools, uh, so they're less reliant on coming to the DevOps team for things uh, in the normal life cycle, development life cycle, right? So I think those are the things uh, I think we look at and measure to see how successful we've been at providing them, um, development teams, um, tools um, and DevOps practices that they can utilize themselves. Got me. In, in all seriousness, the, 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 the grumpiness factor, the fights in progress meter, whatever we want to call it, right, between the, the app dev engineering teams and the infrastructure folks, that is, you know, a real measure of how is this working, right? doesn't mean it's necessarily successful or not, but you're making progress. Um, I, I think the other thing for us that, that I know has been successful is, you know, we have an environment meltdown, and what used to take days to spin up now takes you know, minutes to spin up. That is a huge benefit for us. And, you know, you're never going to be able to prevent environments from melting down, but it's about the recovery time for us. And for us, you know, it is much faster. Now we're able to, um, so we have peaks and valleys. Again, we were talking about like slow times and, and busy times for, for, you know, the companies. You know, for us, when we hit a peak, right, it, it's a pretty big peak. Maybe not so much, you know, FedEx right now with, you know, shipping and things like that, but, you know, we do have our major peaks. and. You have to be able to scale this, you know, the enablement that the DevOps technologies have put in and the practices have put in allow us to scale and then contract and go from there. So um, for, for me, that, that's when I know that it's successful is when something does happen, we recover a lot faster. And then traditionally, whenever we do have our peaks in the past, it was very painful and we had to prep and build a bunch of things for those peaks and then tear them down after the fact. Now, we don't have to worry about that so much. We just naturally come up and down. Uh, not across all of our infrastructure, but in, in our key areas, that's where we're focusing to pull that out. So I think um, there's a couple of things. First of all, the, the, the things that you guys have mentioned, I think, are absolutely part and parcel with an effective DevOps measurement uh, program, but lagging indicators. Yeah. I think some of the leading indicators that just to kind of shine the other end of the spectrum is the amount of questions we get that are sort of challenging the status quo, the amount of potential adopters we have that are lining up before any sort of functionality or new, you know, self-service or API that does, you know, something that's DevOps oriented that are saying, hey, you know, I'd love to go first. Um, and just the general attention and focus to a topic like DevOps across the, uh, the FedEx IT community are very strong leading indicators that tell me that we're onto something, we've communicated fairly effectively, and our culture is poised to make step function changes 
and some of the lagging indicators you guys mentioned in terms of recoverability, deployments, lead time, and otherwise? Yeah, so you, you guys hit the four biggies in one way, shape, or form, right? The industry measures the lag metrics are mean time to recovery um, and change failure rate. So how often, how, how quickly can we, on average, re recover from a problem? And how often, when we do a deployment, do we have to go fix it because it wasn't right as sort of quality metrics? And then the agility metrics are, you know, deployment frequency um, on, on the whole, uh, you know, you can be measured in deploys per day. Uh, and then lead time for changes. How long does it take a change to get in production? Are you guys, I mentioned those because you, you, you didn't use those terms, but you, you each mentioned them in some way, shape, or form. How do you feel it's important to, to accurately measure those and communicate those, or are you using them more as a sort of a litmus? Because Robert, you in particular said it just feels better, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it feels better because we're, and I'm wondering is that, is it all sort of anecdotal, or is there is there more hard science behind it? You know, so for us, it, it's pretty anecdotal, right? You know, we had, we, we were very aggressively tracking deployments, you know, count, right? And what we found is we got to the point where we could deploy faster than the business could handle. And so that metric became less important to us because now our business is telling us, wait, you cannot, you can't do you that. Even though you're ready, I'm tired of, you know, having to retrain my people. I'm tired of having to update my apps and things like that. And so for us, you know, that, that one, we, we kind of, Took the took the air out of that one. We do, um, you know, there are certain areas where we're still what I would consider very strict and stringent on the number of uh, deployments. Uh, we obviously measure quality of deployment, right? That's you know again key and critical for us. But we don't have like a a huge dashboard that people look at every single day or anything like that, right? We do measure the teams, um, you know, the collective teams. Um, ability to deliver code on the time they committed to delivering it. And that's something mm -hmm. that we've been measuring and, and that's enabled by the pipelines and the automation that we've built, but it's not a, a direct relation just to that technology. Are we delivering when we say we're gonna deliver? Yeah, I'd probably say about the same, you know, in the early parts of our DevOps journey, those were more important, those statistics and showing the value, but I think as <clears> we've <throat> kind of gone on, they've kind of fallen off and we don't really, Follow-up questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I, I do have a question. Just I know in times past, being a part of office transformation, one of the ways IT is one of the things the business, not necessarily a collaborator. <coughs> so I'm curious in your, your journey, have you felt yourself now getting more of a business collaborator on what you're From a DevOps perspective, I'd probably say, you know, my customers are the application development team. So I wouldn't say I deal as much with the business side of things uh, as much as the application development teams may. So um, those are my customers. I'll, I'll tell you where it, where it has mattered is it's not your typical business role, but financial controls and compliance. Um, changing the conversation from that perspective has been, um, you know, a huge point of interest for our transformation effort to ensure that as our development teams show competency, they're not running into artificial barriers that are self-imposed from a, um, a compliance or control perspective. So that's been kind of a unique and frankly very um, enlightening and valuable relationship to nurture as we've been going through our transformation. Yeah, compliance is often the codification of the way we've always done things. Sure. So you always rub it, when you're trying to change, you're always rubbing up against it whether you want to or not, right? That's good, that's great, great. Robert, anything to add? No, I mean, I, you know, at any moment we're an enabler or we're a partner, right? So, you know, for me, my, my role is to partner with the business and enable my team to satisfy whatever they're looking for, right? We, we It's funny, we're meeting with my team earlier today and we were having a good discussion with our leaders from Mexico on, you know, we are a consultancy for them, right? We need to understand what their business is doing so that we can provide the appropriate technology for them. 
but at times we're also an order taker, right? It's not just, you know, we have to know what hat it is based on the conversation we're having and, and who's at the table with us. So it's, it's balancing that out. Other questions? Excellent. Let's move on. Question five. What technologies are you using to support your DevOps transformation and why did you choose them? We've already talked a little bit about some of these. Are, are there, you know, we've mentioned a few CICD things that, that teams are doing, uh, containerization. Is there any uh, technology set that you, you have uh, found that particularly helped you and why? So um, I'll answer it a different question, I guess. It's similar but different, right? Where, you know, I, I think when we started early on, we were like, okay, what is our, you know, containerization technology? And it was like, we have to have one. What is our... Um, you know, configuration technology, and we had to have one. What is our source code repository technology? We had to have one. That was an early on thought, and it's not like what we had it, but from a pipeline perspective, and that's one of the big changes we've made is we're much more adaptive so that we can bring more people into the table where we were a little bit constricted in, well, I can't take, you know, this technology from app dev space because it doesn't fit with the pipeline tool set that I've, that I've created over here. So we, we don't have, I was speaking with my team earlier this week, just for this question, and, and they're like, yeah, we don't really have just one thing, right? We, you know, for source code, we use the, the Azure tool, but that's really the only row when you look at the wheel of, of DevOps tools that we only have a single thing. Everything else, we have multiple uh, technologies installed to handle the different technologies that we use. And that's even for a company that has a relatively consistent technology yeah. stack. Yeah. Good. Burkhan? Um, I think you, you mentioned uh, CI, CD orchestrator, um, containerization, right. and I think a container platform, I don't, know, I don't know if you mentioned that, I think is very critical as well. Um, I think has been, I think it's been helped us be successful in running <laughs> containers. So can you can you be a little more specific? What do you, what are you referring I, to there? So uh, container platforms, I think, uh, bring a lot of capabilities. You know, Docker. The, Docker is a common container uh, containerization engine, but container platforms like Kubernetes or uh, other technologies, I think, are very helpful. In, and I think they make. I think they really help us be successful in running containers. To be honest, I think they do bring a lot of neat capabilities that I think any, uh, all teams can benefit from. So my, my peers, my peers and I are being probably a little bit coy. This is like a little bit of a borderline NDA question. I think from a FedEx perspective, and since we're not under NDA, I can tell you we're using GitLab for source code management and CloudBees for CI and CD. Um, aside from that, you know, we have some other stuff in the space that's you know interesting. But in terms of the rationale and stuff, that that's something I can't really disclose. Sure. Is there is there a family of tools or a family of technologies or is there a hole, I guess, in the family of technologies that you think needs to be filled? Right? Is there are are you are you is there a problem you're trying to solve and that you're going, boy, I wish there was a tool that did X. I can't think of anything anymore, right? I mean I think we've we've they've been invented or we've solved them and in, in or moved beyond. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I, you know, and early on, it was that stitching together the, the life cycle. I think we had some struggles there, but I think we've, we've overcome that. Um, so I don't, can't think of anything that's like, oh my gosh, if we just had somebody that had done this or if we could build that, I, I can't think of anything. I have some personal thoughts, but, um, you know, that's, that, those are just personal. Follow-up questions. Yeah, now everyone wants to know. We're yeah. <laughs> digging the social media pages, looking for what's up, what's up. Um, all right. So our our last um, scheduled question for tonight is: um, How did your IT processes change as a result of your transformation? Who wants to start? Uh, I'll, I'll start. You know, I mentioned a little bit around kind of our our idle processes, so change management, incident management, those things have changed pretty drastically 
um, and they're still changing today in the way that we do things. So our policies had to change, our processes changed because um, things are just different, right? You know, you don't, you know, we don't catalog every single um, thing that is running code for us anymore like we used to try to do. Um, it's just, it's just not necessary anymore. So the, the way we operate changes when we're trying to do, you know, collision detection, for example, right? So it's, it's different today than it was before, and it's based off of the different technologies and how we are archiving kind of the activities that are happening within our ecosystem. So, so those things had to change. I think the, the audit, I mentioned that a little bit as well, just how they come in and, and try to grab all of our artifacts is, is another um, current struggle that we have today, right? You know, we work with outside firms, you know, that, that are, you know, big four firms come in and they are not ready for, you know, full-blown DevOps culture and technology transformation from a company that they're still looking for. I need to see your CIs. I want to, and we're, we don't, our CIs are now moved to, you know, what the configuration is, not a named CI anymore in, in most instances. So I think some of the, the struggles are there. These also get wrapped into our cloud transformation and the, the struggles we, we're at there, right? So, you know, for Concube Commission, that they're, they're closely tied for, for their evolution for us, you know, it's, it's the same thing, right? As we are expanding out into our different cloud providers, um, you know, using the tools that they have for their DevOps and blows up the, the way that we do a lot of things internally. So that, that changes a lot. Monitoring was a huge thing, right? I think we've changed monitoring tools three different times uh, in the five years I've been here because of the the changes in the technology and the way that we're capturing our events, right? That drastically changes. And so the way that we do that and what we do with that is, is uh, significantly changed as well. So I think, you know, look at the way that we used to, to operate from an uh, idle process, from a, um, you know, kind of SDLC process. Those have, have all been relatively blown up, right? We're, we're by a lot of our policies. Uh, and then a lot of our uh, processes to, to support those policies. Generic answer, I know, but it, it, it is a significantly impacting event for us. Yeah, I'd say our sources, our procurement processes, you know, just by the nature of us moving to DevOps practices and, and going to the cloud, have really blown some of those up, to be honest, and um, really helped streamline them uh, just by the nature of the change that we've made on the back end. Um, our ITIL processes, you know, they, I think, has been harder change for us. Um, I think some of them have tried to move along to where we are, but I think there's still a lot more work to be done to really, truly, you know, move the needle on them to be a bit more agile and aligned to what we're doing with DevOps. Yeah, just to summarize maybe you guys' two points is leaning into automation and you know, tool-driven evidence is the frontier that we're super interested in versus separation of duties type processes. Um, Back so, to ITIL totally again. Exactly. So we're, um, I would love to say that we're like done and we've got all our processes perfectly aligned, but it, it is absolutely a journey. Uh, but it seems that the recipe seems to be something like, show me some evidence, teach me how this works, and then maybe I'll, you know, I'll align accordingly. Um, can't be the other way around. We can't say, hey, change all your stuff because we're, you know, this is going to work, I promise. Um, it seems to be more of an evidence-based process change. Yeah, interestingly, uh, I had an opportunity to speak with some of the folks on the ITIL committee when I was at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, I had lunch with this, uh, a woman that's a consultancy. She sits on the board of ITIL, whatever that means. ITIL, by the way, started over in England. Uh, and it's still actively uh, looked at. And they were, at the DevOps Enterprise Summit, ITIL was a punching bag. Okay? I mean, you couldn't enter a conversation where someone was poo pooing all over ITIL processes. Uh, and this woman was there to sort of absorb that and understand that they're actually rebranding ITIL entirely now. ITIL 5, for example, instead of being called change management, they're calling it change enablement. <laughs> all of our problems are solved. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, I think it's, uh, it, obviously the proof is in the pudding to see how well it adjusts, but I, I think they have a message that it, uh, it's been a restrictive a set of policies and procedures uh, that have basically defined how IT gets run for the last 30 years, um, and, I, and I think it's, uh, it, it's high time for the change. 
were any of the processes, I mean, you mentioned compliance being a bit of a bit of a rub. Were any of them easier than you thought? <laughs> and everything's easy to me, right? Everything's easy. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the problem with it. No, I, they, th this has been been an ongoing transformation, right? I was going to say battle, but I'm, I'm trying to put a positive spin, right? It's it, you know, it is it is something that we're not done with, right? And as we put you know, different tools in, we have to change again, and, and it's it's all for the good, right? And, and that's the one positive thing for our side is the teams that are pushing back on us and they're struggling with us, right? You know, they realize this is the right thing to do, so it's been a positive conversation. It's just been hard to get to the right solution, you know? One thing I don't think we mentioned yet in this room was, you know, security, right? So their, their world has changed a ton because of this enablement as well, right? They, they're very used to, you know, being able to see this and that and the other, and you know these, um, you know these technology technology entities living for long durations, and that doesn't exist anymore either, right? And so, um, you know, that that's been a it's not been a struggle because we've we've got some good people who are engaged and and wanting to be a part of the conversation, so that's helpful. But it is a it's a difficult problem to solve too. I'm going to tie this back to um, question about. What benefits have you seen? I guess the one thing, and none of the process changes are easy, but the willingness to experiment in a controlled setting and have some dials in place to say, all right, well, let's let's give this a go in this kind of space um, and have the stakeholders on board to try some stuff and truly challenge the status quo has been refreshing um, and very kind of, I don't know, exciting, I guess, to just try stuff and see if it works. Without blowing stuff up. Well, that's why the controls are there, yeah. and, and, all, and everyone's watching, so it's not like you know, we have to go beg for forgiveness. We are asking for permission, but it's like a slice here to go sure. you know, test something out and prove it and then expand it if, if everything goes as we expect it. Yeah, uh, your question was if anything was much easier than uh, yeah. to do or change. I can't think of anything. Uh, I, no. Sorry. I thought that might be the case. <laughs> Um, we're going to open the, the floor. Okay, a follow-up question here? Yeah. Quick question. I heard a few things about audit and configured items. Did, you, did any of you find that uh, alt as a part of this, or did they just die on the line? <clears throat> oh, wait, that's a good question. Uh, I'm trying to look and see who's in the room from my office. Um, yeah, is that to, so it, it has evolved significantly. Right, we, we've spent uh, over the five years I've been a service master a ton of energy trying to perfect that thing, knowing that it can never be perfect, but we needed it to be better. Uh, and this has just thrown a, a big curveball into that. It, it, uh, just because, the, the, again, the rate of change, it is not meaningful to have all of that information anymore, right? So I mentioned earlier, we're, we're moving from, you know, server ABC123 to configuration for what could be a thousand servers you know, moving, making that change, even that's been a slow roll with our audit committee and, and explaining to them that that's the natural progression of where we're at because things live for minutes now instead of months, right? You know, uh, it, it's, MDB is not, um, not useless for us, but it certainly has lessened in value. I think we go to some of the tools that we've implemented more often than we do to the CMDB anymore to really figure out what's happening and, and what's existing and what happened you know three minutes ago. Oh well, I see where we spun this up and we or we or we spun that down or we deployed this piece of code. It's becoming that that tool suite is becoming a lot more functional us, uh, for us in our in our daily lives than what used to be the CMDB. Okay. God, he knows. <laughs> well, I, he knows instead of things. I would say because our estate is, you know, so broad and we have so much heterogeneity, um, the CMDB is absolutely critical. But if you think about the purpose of the CMDB from 10 years ago and what its kind of prime function was versus now, I would offer it's a different conversation. And the way we manage our 
assets from an IT perspective, given you know cloud native technology, containers, and um, you know software defined network compute storage. All these are new capabilities that give us different ways to control and manage the estate, which has kind of a different set of solutions associated with it than your traditional through central um, CMDB. But but it would be um, we have so much uh, heritage that we absolutely have to have and maintain and continue to improve the richness of, and the accuracy of the data in our CMDB. Uh, heritage, that's a great word. I love that word. That's great, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Love that. Uh, other follow-up questions on this topic? We're gonna, I'm going to open the floor up for just general questions here in a second, but I wanted to give our, our panelists an opportunity for just any closing remarks that they might want to throw in before we start taking open questions. One thing I would say, I mean, hopefully everybody's moving or starting their job DevOps journey. I think there's a lot of benefits to it if you haven't already seen them. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I think there's a lot of resources now with this forum here that Dan has started, which is great, you know, to be able to collaborate and ask questions, figure out, you know, what challenges you're running into. So I would encourage everyone to keep doing that. And I think um, I think there's a lot of benefits to DevOps that, that I think everybody can benefit from. So. Yeah, for us, you know, you know, if I, if I could go back in a time machine, we would be a lot better, but we'd still make a million mistakes, right? So don't get frustrated when you make mistakes or you make a bad decision or you go off in a path that you felt was going to be the perfect one only to realize that it's the exact opposite direction you could have or, or should have gone in, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a very learning experience and you're going to change the tools, you're going to change your processes and it, it will never stop, right? And it does disrupt the way that you do work every single day, which is a great thing, right? That's, this is all for the good. There are great things that are happening because we're, we're on this journey together. So, um, but if you haven't started, start. It's cautious, but start. Yeah, ditto and take risks, but Take small risks. <laughs> yeah, small bets. <laughs> yeah, to make small bets and customers define quality. And if you don't know who your customers are, make that your first priority to understand who is it that's using your stuff and uh, get to know them real, real well. We've got just a few minutes. Thank you all, by the way. So I just want to give them a quick round. We have just a few minutes for open questions before we get to closing remarks for today's uh, meeting. Anybody have uh, some other question you've been dying to ask our panelists? Any shy people today? Okay. Well, once again, thanks, guys. Appreciate your time. Uh, I know Robert has a hard stop at four. Um, well, hopefully we can he can hang out until then. We can uh, wrap up a little bit early. You can you can take a question offline if you have one. Um, I wanted to uh, just tell you a little bit about our plans for the future and what we're going to be doing in this group uh, coming up next year. Uh, first of all, thank all of you for making this group uh, successful. I think 2019 was our our best year yet, so to speak. Um, we had uh, a huge number of people attend uh, meetings throughout the year. Uh, and next year is really starting to take shape as well. Uh, the entire 2020 calendar, all the meetups that are planned for next year is already posted out on Meetup. So if you want to go see what's there, what dates are there. Um, and I haven't quite put the entire agenda together yet, um, but we will have AJ Paul is coming back from with uh, Apex Systems for sure, a speaker from Kong, uh, a speaker uh, who will be talking about the Istio framework. We're also going to be doing an all-day uh, DevOps viewing party. Uh, I've been invited to speak at all-day DevOps next year. It's in November, I believe. And uh, the way, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's an online conference. It gets about 25,000 attendees every year. And they have something like 150 <coughs> speakers across the entire world. Uh, and it literally runs for 24 hours straight. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that they like to do is, as a speaker is presenting, they can have a live audience. So we'll have a viewing party, we'll make this meeting, that viewing party, uh, we can attend and watch some of the, the sessions together and have discussion around those sessions. Uh, and that'll be the, the meeting that we use to close out 
next year. Um, Danny, you wanted to plug the GitLab, or excuse me, the uh, the Google Docs. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Danny Thompson. I think some of you may know me. If you don't, hopefully we'll fix that. I'm the chapter founder of Google Developer Group Memphis, or GDG Memphis. All of our meetups are on meetup.com, so you can find us there. Uh, you can add me on LinkedIn, and I advertise the hell out of it as well. But um, tomorrow we have a very special meetup. We actually have the CTO and CEO of UCLA, speedtest.net. Uh, they're flying in from Seattle to deliver a talk tomorrow. Everyone is invited. I'm expecting a huge group. We're already at, I think it's 80 RSVPs and growing, so I think it's going to be a great turnout for the city. We also have our holiday party that's next week on the 12th, which all of you are invited to as well. Both events will have a wine bar, beer, all the good stuff, plus food, so we won't have to worry about just water there. But uh, <laughs> the event will be at New York Park, which is just up the street. Uh, one other thing is that we're under Memtech as well, so uh, we support Memphis technology and all the initiatives that we do in the city. So whatever we can do for you guys, just please let me know and I'm trying to do it. So thank you. Uh, we have a quick note from the FedEx Institute. If everyone could take a moment to check in at the FedEx Institute on your social media platform of your choice, they would really appreciate it. Uh, this is obviously a, a big event for them today. Uh, and we appreciate them being sponsored. So if, you, if you're a social media person, go ahead and check in. Let people know you're here. Uh, that'd be great. Um, I need help. And I'll just leave it at that. I, I need help. Uh, so I've been, I've been driving this group for uh, the last three years predominantly on my own. I could use uh, a couple of folks to help me with organizing and communications. Uh, if you are interested, particularly if you're a regular attendee and you're, you're, uh, you're consistently here, if you're interested in helping, please just send me a note. I've, I've got a lot of different things to do. We're not at a spot where we're trying to make officers and do have a big formal complex around this, right? It's just, I wanna keep this as casual as we can, uh, but it is getting to be quite a bit of work. So uh, if you're interested and you have some bandwidth you'd like to help, please just drop me a line. Uh, and finally, um, we have a giveaway today. Uh, who was it that brought the book? Thank you, it was a gift. We're gonna be giving it away today. Uh, and I figure what we do is have our panelists help with this. Um, so, Seth, number between one and four. Three. Whole number. Three. Three, okay. Robert, number between one and two. Oh, uh, one. One. All right. So, Furkan, a number between one and eight. Seven. George Spake, wow. are you here? <laughs> Yeah. I asked the question. He asked the question about the, 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 the unicorn. It's the newer one. It's the new one. It's not the Phoenix Park. It's the unicorn. That's the new one. How great is that? Good random generator. It was random. It's a good random generator. I mean, I just, yeah. I've never been part of a random generator before. So. Congratulations. <laughs> you added to your job. Yeah. I know. That was so again, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we're going to be in this room until four o'clock. Please, some pizza. Continue to have the networking. Hopefully, our panelists will be able to stick around a few minutes. You can ask some questions, get autographs and selfies, and all those things that you want to do. Thanks again. See ya.